Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we've got a great webinar lined up for you. We are. This is the fourth webinar in our private series that is just for you guys, the AWS Machine Learning Competency Partners, so we're thrilled to have you. Um, today, we've got, um, I just want to introduce our presenters. Our main presenter today is Pratap Ramamurthy. He is a partner solutions architect. He works with AWS partners and helps them build their solutions on top of AWS. Um, he works with partners that specialize in machine learning and AI. Prior to AWS, he was a researcher where he worked on creating quantum dot lasers, test tools for web servers, and optimized Wi-Fi using game theory. Currently, he focuses on machine learning, specifically natural language processing, which is a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Um, also on the call with us today is Chris Burns, and he's going to be kind of handling the, the Q&A in the chat in the bottom um, right corner of your nav. Um, Chris is also a senior partner solutions architect with an AIML specialty. He used to be a mechanical engineer who installed and maintained industrial robots and now uses his 18 years of industry experience in software development, distributed solution architecture, and machine learning to help partners across the entire AWS ML stack. So those are the... Um, the folks that are going to be presenting and answering your questions on the call today. Um, the, I, I said that in the kind of the bottom right nav um, of this right toolbar, you see a questions pane and you also see a chat pane. Either, way, either place is fine to put your questions. Chris is going to be monitoring those. And we'll try to answer some of those live throughout the call. But in any case, they'll be documented as we answer those questions here um, so that people who see this recording um, or if you want to come back and look at it again, you can kind of take a look at what those questions were. Um, so without further ado, I would love to introduce Pratap and let's get started. Oh, thank you, Sue. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, like she said, this is the um, fourth in the webinar series. Um, and my name is Pratap. I'm a partner solutions architect and I work with machine learning partners. Um, today, um, we're going to be talking about sequence to sequence algorithm, um, one of the most um, uh, complex algorithms in the suite. All right. So this is the um, schedule that we had. Uh, I think we've had two before, and today is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence algorithm, and here is a tentative schedule for the next ones. Um, I just wanted to give uh, uh, upfront um, information about, I think the title of the webinar initially said that it's going to be sequence-to-sequence -sequence and blazing text. Um, these, uh, these two are uh, related uh, algorithms, related to natural language processing. Um, usually blazing text is what people would use to um, convert uh, words uh, into a lower dimensional space and then run on a sequence to sequence algorithms or other algorithms. Um, but based on feedback and uh, popular demand, we're going to be focusing on one of the algorithms today and we will be focusing, uh, looking at blazing text uh, at a future date. So right now we have the date of uh, September 6th, um, as you can see in line number um, six here. All right, let's get on with the today's webinar, a sequence to sequence algorithm. What is a sequence to sequence algorithm? A sequence to sequence algorithm is an algorithm which takes a string of inputs and produces another string of inputs. So we might, we might have heard about regression algorithms which predicts a number or a classification algorithm which predicts uh, one among the n classes. Um, uh, this is a different kind of a machine learning problem, or we can say this is a classification problem where it's trying to um, a class, uh, find the predict a sequence, uh, but this is that is that does not really help because the metrics are different and so on. All right? What is the use for sequence to sequence? Uh, while it's it's a general purpose sequence to sequence, you can think of like providing this algorithm with any sequence um, and expecting another sequence. Um, th this problem is usually handled in natural language processing, um, or NLP, or computational linguistics. Um, and this has been uh, the primary uh, uh, driver for uh, dramatically improving the accuracy of translation services. So a new field uh, of uh, uh, of translations called neural machine translation, NMT, that is the first um, use case here, um, is what uh, is being dramatically improved by uh, by this class of algorithms. Um, and the, this is this is like 
it's, this, I think this becomes immediately intuitive, right? So you provide a string of words or a sentence. A sentence is a sequence of words. And into this algorithm, and after it's trained, um, when you're predicting, when you give this input, it produces another string of words in another language. So you can pr translate, use the machine to translate from one human language to another language. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, as you can see, you can, you can read many of the papers. This has improved the blue scores quite a bit. The second kind, uh, second use case are summarizers. Um, summarizers uh, are uh, very important for media, where you take, you provide a large text, um, uh, like an like a entire document, like an uh, article. Uh, this could be like 2,000 words and so on. And it produces a one paragraph that summarizes the content of that large article. Um, uh, these ha there are several different ways of doing this, uh, but sequence to sequence is, is one of the ways you can do this. The third is speech to text. This is a slightly different form and um, um, uh, where you provide the um, uh, speech and then it creates a string of, um, of words uh, which, which maximizes the prediction. But the first two use cases are much more uh, relevant where we, you really provide a string and expect a string. Okay, um, but even there are, there are subtleties to this, right? Let's take, the, so this, in this webinar, I'm going to be focusing on the neural machine translation, um, and let's let's look at machine translation. What is um, uh, what is the use case? This, even with machine translation, um, this problem is not a single problem, but it's more of a class of problems. Let me explain how that works. Right. So when you take translation, uh, uh, when we as human beings know a language, when we know more than one language, and when we can translate, we actually do it intuitively. Uh, but we actually do several things at the same time. That is, the problem of translation of a single word um, is, uh, is is just like a lookup, right? Uh, from one vocabulary to another vocabulary based on the context. Um, that is a different problem compared to a short phrase. How do you translate a short phrase from one language to another? Um, uh, and compared to a sentence level translation, where you provide a sentence, a sentence is usually uh, anywhere between a few words up to uh, 60 or 70 words typically, but there are sentences that are uh, much uh, longer. Um, the, 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 the problem becomes very different at that point where there should be a grammatical structure, um, and it should capture all the things said in the sentence. Um, at the same time, um, uh, it should it should be within the uh, uh, length. A different uh, translation would be a document level translation, um, where the context. So, for example, you could take of a think of a, a entire book being translated. Um, in this case, uh, uh, the, the problem becomes very different because things said in the like say the first chapter. Uh, such as introduction of characters in that story might not be repeated uh, in the fourth and in the in the chapters that come after that. Um, so, but but when folks read this, when human beings read a, uh, a book um, or a story that's said in the book, um, they would remember the characters and what they did before the first chapters, and then continue to understand what is happening through the entire text of the book. Um, and this. Uh, this becomes a much bigger problem for uh, for machines because machines really do not understand the meaning um, of words. Uh, they only have a representation. Um, and f it is not possible for machines to do this very easily. So that becomes a very different problem uh, when it's trying to translate things in the, like, the, chat, the, in the later chapters, right? So even machine translations, as you can see, is, is very varied. Um, and that, that is what brings it uh, rich, richness to this problem. Today, um, uh, what we'll be seeing is sentence-level um, translations. Um, uh, that, that is a use case we'll be looking at for sequence-to-sequence -sequence, um, algorithm. Okay, um, so uh, just a quick warning um, uh, that I will start slow. Like, uh, this, is a, this is a very in-depth um, uh, uh, topic. Um, there's a there's several levels of depth to this, so I will try to start uh, to bring everybody to the same page, uh, but it would ramp up pretty quickly. Um, so uh, don't worry if you are not if you're new to this topic. It may not be easy to follow, but you can always refer back to this and and be able to catch on. 
All right. So before we understand sequence to sequence, the core of this is uh, RNNs or LSTMs. But before we understand RNNs or LSTMs, uh, which is a form of deep learning, let's first understand how uh, neural networks. Um, this is an example neural network. Um, the um, LO uh, uh, ones, LO nodes are the input neurons, and that's where you insert, you provide input. It, it flows through, it propagates uh, uh, through the network, and you get an output at the end to the right. So there's propagation from left to right in this diagram. Um, but the important point about this is that each node, um, uh, your each neuron calculates um, a linear combination of the inputs, and then applies an activation function, and then uh, uh, sends the input to the next layer, sends the output, sorry, to the next layer. Um, but if you notice one thing about this is the input, uh, the, the neural network does not maintain any state. That is, you provide an input, it gives you an output. The story ends there, right? So if you want another uh, prediction, you provide a different input. It never remembers what the input was before uh, the, this input. Um, at least this, this is uh, during the inference phase, that is. This is. I'm not talking about the training phase. During the inference phase, each input is taken separately. And uh, it does not maintain any state at all. The only thing the neural network remembers is its, its own weights. Um, and the network uh, model infrastructure uh, architecture itself, right? Now, this is a problem <clears throat> when you're looking at a string of uh, 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 words, like a sentence, where, um, uh, and this is not how we process things in natural language, right? So when I speak a sentence, uh, you are hearing the first word and then the next words, um, and so it's more of a sequence of words, and you progressively understand what I'm, I'm saying or what you're reading as well. So that this does not amend uh, very well for those kinds of problems. So, <clears throat> so what we have is a is a different kind of uh, network called uh, recurrent neural networks or RNNs. <clears throat> um, what you're seeing is a single neuron, and it operates pretty. Uh, it, it, there is some intuition to this, and I, well, let's explain this. So here the input is uh, is sent from the bottom, right? Uh, where A is the neuron here. Um, it has some uh, computational uh, power in there, right? It does some uh, computation, like maybe uh, um, uh, um, a matrix multiplication or activation functions, and so on. And you then um, get uh, output that is represented as HT. Um, it's called hidden state. Um, and uh, what happens next is um, it remembers something that was said about um, uh, the, the first input. And so when you send the second word in the, in the sequence, um, it is going to use that. Um, uh, it's going to use that uh, to combine that with the second input and then make a computation of that and then return a, a sequence of outputs. So this is a single neuron, um, right? Uh, but it's a little harder to understand. So we usually represent in what's called the unrolled diagram. Um, it, it's, these two diagrams are pretty much the same, uh, but uh, this is, makes it a little easier to uh, visualize what is going on. Um, uh, please note that the, the picture on the right side is the same as the picture on the left. Um, the picture on the right does not have four neurons. It's the same um, RNN node or cell, right? So uh, let me restate what I said before. So the first stage is, let's say you're, you're giving uh, input X0 uh, to the neuron. Um, it's going to do some kind of a processing, maintain some state, also uh, give an output of H0, right? Um, and then you move on to uh, time step T equals 1, and now you're, you're providing input number uh, X1, that is the second word maybe, um, and now it takes this, um, it, since it's maintained the state, now you're adding a new input, it's going to take that processing and also create a second output, that is H1, and then it moves on until you provide xn, uh, when uh, it, this would be the final uh, character or a terminating word, uh, which would term, which would tell the uh, the the cell RNN cell that the sequence has terminated, and this would uh, this would also be absorbed. Uh, uh, there would be some computation, and it would it would uh, emit uh, hn. So this is this is the intuition or a very high level use of uh, of RNN recurrent neural networks, but the problem was that um, so this is this is also an unrolled another way to look at things um, and uh, it's, it, I mean, this is the same picture as before. Um, here we mark uh, inputs as x t minus one t and t plus one, 
Um, what you're seeing in the middle is, is like an X-ray view of what is happening in, internally, um, where uh, when you are uh, providing the XT, teeth input, um, to the cell, um, it has, uh, from the, you can see from the left side, that it, ha it is taking some input from before. This is, this is the um, a hidden state, or S state of the cell. Um, it takes that uh, input, um, or, or that state, combines that with the new input, and then you apply, it, it performs some kind of a computation, applies uh, an activation function, a TANH, uh, for example, here, you might have heard of TANH function from neural networks as well. Um, and once it's computed, uh, computed this, it's going to emit an external um, um, uh, output called HT um, at T state, and then it's continuing to go into save this as a state to be passed on to the next state. So this is this. If you look at this, this is kind of very similar to a neuron, how a neuron works, except that now you have a state being maintained um, in this uh, in this cell. Um, this is what is or what is called uh, what we would call a cell. Uh, but there are, they found that um, um, there are some real hard problems with this. Like, all this was fine, but the main problem was that um, the RNNs are really hard uh, to train. Um, and they are uh, extremely hard to, um, uh, to find the right parameters to make it work. RNNs do work. Um, but they are, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's like a, um, it's, it's super hard to find the right parameters to make it work. Uh, there are uh, additional hyperparameters in addition to the ones you're familiar with um, in a normal neural network. Um, so what happens is it also suffers from a, from a concept called a vanishing gradient or exploding gradient. Um, the vanishing gradient says that um, as you're multiplying this um, across a sequence. Um, let's say you have a sequence of 60 words. Um, you're multiplying these words or inputs uh, with a very small number. Let's say it's like 0 0.01. And if you multiply this, um, say, 60 times, it becomes a really small number. So that's called a vanishing uh, gradient problem. Or in the other way, it's, uh, it, it could either be, it could have a very large number. And so what would happen is it would, it would explode. That the learn not, uh, if, as you continue to multiply in this operation right here, this would continue to explode and it would become a really large number, um, at which point, at both these points, either at zero or at a really large number, the gradient is not the where you have the right gradients where uh, it, would, it, would, it, it would stop learning. It would go to one end of the spectrum and would stop learning. So it, you need to be like really careful in the way that you you uh, co configure this, right? So that's how that's when people uh, came with a new something, a new type of cell called long short-term memory. This is kind of very similar to RNNs, except that it has some more additional operations, right? Um, let's 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 look at this briefly because this is the core of a sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, model. Right. So if you look at this, as you can see, this is a hidden state, right? This this horizontal line that is passing through the cell. This is the the state that is maintained by the cell. Uh, a new input comes in. There's some more additional uh, parameters, additional uh, sorry operations that are done on the um, on the on the inputs, um, and you're adding to the state. Um, in addition to that, what you're doing is you're also sending an output. But uh, don't worry too much about the operations here, because this is only a sample operation. Um, uh, as people realize that the state uh, or the operation in the cell need not be confined to a simple operation, uh, they came up with many different kinds of LSTMs. So it's not just a single LSTM that's out there. There are lots and lots of different kinds of uh, uh, LSTMs, um, and that does each one could do a different thing. But the main important thing to note is what is called um, uh, uh, the gating factor, right? So this part is, is probably the most important, where it takes the input, and what it tells you is um, the, the problem, it tries to solve the problem with regular RNNs. That is, um, it tries to uh, tell you which of the words um, uh, does, uh, which of the sequences in the past uh, needs to be taken into account for this uh, output. Right, so this is called a gating factor, where um, in addition to the sequence, in addition to the state, it also tells, uh, takes uh, uh, opinion on um, whether uh, whether a sequence from the history should be considered as a, a, a for this computation at this point uh, t, 
uh, time is equal to t right so that is the most important concept um and this has enabled uh, to solve the uh, exploding or vanishing gradient uh, problem to a large extent and you right now you you almost never see rnns uh, the the plain old rnns being utilized utilized it's usually the lstms uh, that are being utilized right so um uh, obviously that this is this is work for a lot of folks and um, um I, I i do want to at this point refer to the blog post um, from which I've taken these excellent pictures. Um, the reference is in the bottom. Um, I, I would highly recommend that you read this blog post as well, which describes LSTMs to a great extent. All right, so those are LSTMs, right? Now, I, this provides a sequence to sequence, right? You provide XT uh, to zero to N, and then it gives you uh, H zero to N. Um, but this is not how you would actually use this. You could use this um, uh, 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 LSTM just like this, uh, but this is not proven to work very well for machine translations, right? Let's look at how um, uh, uh, how it was modified. So a new architecture was proposed, um, I think in the year 2014, um, which is called an encoder decoder architecture. Let's look at how it works, right? This is this is probably the most important picture of this um, a presentation, right? So what you're looking here is uh, a sequence um, and uh, how an input and output, uh, how input is being presented to the LSTM and how the output is uh, taken out. Um, as you can see, the rectangular boxes represent LSTM cells, right? This is unrolled picture, so this is one and this is one. Um, so what you're doing is, is you're providing the uh, input is A, B, C, and you would always see in NLP, you'll always see the symbol called EOS, uh, it stands for end of sentence, right? So here the, the input sequence we are giving here is A, B, C, end of sentence. And the output that it's providing you is W, X, Y, Z, end of sentence, right? Um, but there is a key difference between this and the previous picture, right? The picture is um, at T equals zero, you are providing the input A um, to the LSTM. It does some processing. Uh, changes the internal state, also gives you, uh, moves on to the next stage. If you notice, there is no output at A, at T equals zero. Um, and then you are providing the um, um, uh, the input B, the second word. Um, it changes the state. It continues on. There is no uh, output. Um, then you provide uh, C. And finally, you provide the end of sentence or a termination word um, to this. At this point, if you notice, it is not provided any output, and you come to this point. So what they have been able to identify with this or achieve with this method is that it's absorbed the sequence of words um, until the end of sentence, and it's not given and it's not started translating and, until this point. So at this point, the internal state actually contains a representation of the entire sentence sequence. Right, uh, it's it's not just this. It is not just a bag of words uh, representation. This is this contains the representation of the per this particular sequence of words, and and at this point, um, now that it's it's noted that it's it's received all the inputs that it can receive from this input string, it starts to emit an output. Here it starts with uh, uh, the word W, right? That's the first uh, input. Now here comes the, the interesting part. What we do is, what we take, we take this uh, output W and we provide that as an input to the same cell. And this triggers something else. So this, this is gonna trigger that, hey, okay, I'm seeing the word W. Now the result I see is the next, it provides you the next word. It's almost like a train rolling after this, right? You, you get the word X, this, this is the output that's emitted uh, X, and then you provide this input again, and it just rolls over until the LSTM gives you the termination word EOS. So what what did what did we achieve with this? Um, there is a very important difference, uh, a, a key uh, a difference between this and the previous one, and it and it's, it it let let us achieve a big, uh, very big thing. That is this architecture. So if you notice, Amazon's translation also uses something like this, uh, Amazon's translation service. Um, and if you notice, Amazon's translation service offers um, uh, several uh, language pairs, 
right? So you have English, French, German, Chinese, and so on. Um, and if you imagine the this translator uh, providing uh, training this on every single language pair, um, this would soon explode, right? So there are so many language pairs. Um, let's say you could you could have English, French, English, German is very common. But what about French, Chinese? What about German, Chinese? Uh, there may not be enough data to be able to train uh, every single pair of languages, right? Now that becomes a bottleneck uh, or a challenge. So what they've uh, did is uh, they don't even it can translate even though they don't have every uh, data training data for every single pair. So what they do is they use the source language and they roll over until the end of sentence, right? So at this point, it has the encoding of the words, right? This is, this is, this is already available. This part does not change. So, and then if you want to uh, uh, translate to a different uh, uh, language, um, you just start with the, uh, we just change the decoder part. That is, uh, you provide with a different decoder and that would start with roll over the first word of that language, and you provide this, and you would unroll into that language. So in this way, they've been able to combine uh, languages for which there are no uh, pairing or bilingual uh, data sets. So this has been a huge advantage in providing large-scale uh, language services. Translation services, I'm sorry. All right, so, and, and, um, you may have noticed that um, I mentioned there was a single layer um, uh, LSTM, but it's typically usually two layer LSTMs. Uh, here you're giving an input sentence of A, B, C, D, and end of sentence. Um, it goes in there, um, and this uh, two layers, it absorbs this. There's a hidden state here, there's a hidden state in the, in the second layer. Um, and this red piece um, is the uh, decoder part, um, uh, decoder layer of the, um, of, the, uh, of the translator, or NMT. Now there is a, there is an interesting piece here. Um, um, uh, it's called uh, a beam search, right? Um, uh, if you notice the, uh, I'm going to go back and explain to you what beam search is. As soon as you give the end of sentence symbol into the decoder, it emits an output. The decoder does not emit really output words. So what this does provide is it provides a distribution function, probability distribution across all words in the language. And the word, uh, let's say here X, um, is probably the one that has the maximum probability or the highest weight associated uh, with that. And so we mark this as X. Uh, but usually, um, uh, it's, it's never gonna be the case that there's only one word that's provided and all words are, are zero. That is like X wouldn't be one and all, all are zero. It would never be the case. It should usually be a distribution, right? Uh, uh, X could have some value and then there could be other words also, but with a slightly lower value. Um, and what you do here is, in this case, um, of, of the distribution across all the words, um, we have chosen the word X because probably it's, it's, a call, it's called a greedy algorithm. What we did here is called a greedy algorithm where you always take the word that has the maximum weight. Um, and you take that word and you provide that as a second word here to get your second word. Right? So in this part, when you always choose, in this distribution, when you always choose the word with the maximum weight, um, that is called the greedy algorithm. But they did realize that this may always not give you the best approach. So what is then they started working on something called a beam search. A beam search works like this. In this case, uh, we, we've gone on several paths. Um, here, the first word that was output is uh, the word A, right? And then when you, once you give A, um, it gives you a distribution across several words. You have a train, steam, black, and locomotive, right? Now, what you do is you look at this, and um, your, let's say, uh, train and steam have um, equally high weights. Um, what you do is you choose train, and you go down that path and you unroll it. You find the sequence. So this is what is called this. You're searching through. Uh, it's called a beam search. Um, a beam search is, is pretty much is a, very similar to a breadth first search in a tree. And, uh, but I think it's, it's constrained by the width. It's called a beam width or beam length, depending on how they call it. Um, so what you would do is you would unroll this by providing this sequence. Um, you would provide, first provide, you, you receive A. 
um, and then let's say you've got train and steam, um, you would choose to first send uh, a train and see where it goes, right? And you would, and you would, what you would do is you would, you would um, uh, find the cumulative um, uh, probability of the sequence, and then you find the end of sentence, and then you would go back, and then you would also do this, and then you would find several different sequences from the same encoding, right? At this point, when you got this, uh, at this point, when you reach the end of the encoding, right, you have the encoding. Now, what you do is, it's not just X, Y, Z, end of sentence that you got. You start with X, and you would explore all the possible uh, um, um, uh, uh, searches, and you would find the cumulative weightage of, 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 of several different um, uh, sequences, and at the end of which, and you would find which is the sequence that gave you the best score. The best score as in uh, the cumulative weights. That is, you multiply, uh, one of the ways to do is you multiply uh, the weights provided for each of these words, and that would be your score. Um, and you would then finally choose the sequence of words with the best, uh, uh, best cumulative um, uh, uh, score. This has been important because um, what happens is this this what the beam search did was um, and there are also several ways in uh, beam, uh, doing beam search but the main concept is that um, let's say when you're starting early um, uh, and this this word train uh, let's let's not take the word train let's say a uh, steam had a really high weightage but then afterwards when you provided the word steam. Uh, to the LSTM, the rest of the words had really low value. It was, it's kind of lost its good. So may, maybe you can think of ways in which, like, you start a sentence very strong, but then um, then you realize this sentence may not be uh, uh, grammatically accurate, um, and so you kind of trail off. It's it's a very similar concept here. That is, it starts strong, um, and so it kind of trails off. Um, um, so, uh, but the train, the word train, might have had a lower score initially, but as you chain these uh, words together. Um, eventually, this cumulative sequence of words could have had a cumulative uh, better score than the other sequence. So that's why that's the way in which they found that they were able to explore all possible um, uh, sequences of words um, that was able that that could be uh, um, uh, valid translations, right? So that's that's uh, that is an important part of this. And the reason I'm giving you all this is. All these would be an important hyperparameter that you would tune in the sequence-to-sequence -sequence, um, algorithm uh, in Amazon built algorithms. Okay, so, um, but even then, we saw that this was this was not sufficient. Um, what they found is in this mechanism, um, you would notice a certain problem here. That is A, B, C, and D, an end of sentence, um, um, after which you start to uh, uh, decode in a different language. There was a problem with this. That is, uh, when it comes up with the word X and starts outputting, um, it does not know which of these words um, um, it, it needs to focus on. Looks like right now it's taking the entire sentence um, and it's focusing on the entire sentence and starts unraveling. Um, this is usually not the way uh, humans translate as well. That is, um, every word ha usually has in translation or a word could have, uh, uh, that you translate, uh, could have uh, relevance only for a few other um, uh, words. For example, let's take this uh, example. Um, a train, a steam engine train uh, traveling down train tracks, right? Um, the um, oh, so, for example, the word traveling uh, 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 is related to only to the train and to uh, to tracks, right? Um, or let's say the, let's take the, the fifth example: a steam engine uh, train traveling through a lush green countryside. Um, and this this is not a good example. But let's say you you have the example: the the tree the the steam engine was traveling fast, um, and it was going and it was going through a lush green countryside. The word "it" here uh, corresponds to the uh, steam engine train, right? So the word "it" is only related to that three words and not other words. So this is what is called attention. That is like when you're translating a particular word um, or a sequence, um, which of the set of words, subset of the words, should the neural network focus on to translate is, is, is the big question here. When they did that, they found that this, this improved um, the scores very, uh, uh, very much. For example, this is what is called a blue score for 
for translations. We look at what blue scores are. You need to understand this to be able to fine tune this. Um, um, this is a is a very typical graph of a blue score for uh, for for um, uh, LSTMs without attention. Um, if you look at these, uh, if you, when you plot the blue scores of translations, blue score represents a score or how good a translation is of a sentence. It it goes up initially as the sentence length increases. Uh, this is because it's it's kind of hard to uh, translate very short uh, sentences uh, that's less than um, one of five words. So the blue score is kind of low. This is this is hard to solve. But uh, but the blue score increases as the number of words increase in a sentence. For example, it peaks around uh, 15 words, but then the blue score kind of drops off, trails off, and it's pretty low when it comes to like 60 word sentences or 70 word sentences. The reason is that as the sentences grow in this diagram. As the sentences grow, let's say this is a very long sequence, um, after which uh, when you first output the first word, um, it needs to like take into account all the words that were said and kind of loses the context. And that's where attention really comes in. That is, uh, when, once you have attention, that is, for example, like this. Um, I think this is uh, German. Um, I, I cannot read German, but the example is kind of, uh, uh, it's intuitive, right? Um, you provide this sentence, and um, when you're outputting the words, uh, when you're getting the outputs, as you can see, these two words um, are uh, paying attention to economic rather than other words. So it, it gives you a mapping of um, outputs to inputs on what needs to be focused on. So that is what is called attention. Here, the, the, the darker lines represent uh, stronger attention weights, and lighter um, uh, um, lines represent uh, lower attention weights. Um, you could be paying attention to more than one word. That's perfectly fine. Um, and as you can see, once you give attention, um, you can see that the blue scores actually goes up and maintains. It's a, you get a pretty high blue score even for uh, sentence lenses, lens of up to 60 words. All right. So that has been a huge improvement in uh, in, in NMT or neural machine translation. Um, this is an interesting graph as to say which words are getting attention. Um, uh, and you can see that uh, this is, uh, as it's uh, providing the output, you can see that it's paying attention to one word. The lighter uh, shade means uh, that's what's paying attention. Darker shade means it's not paying attention. So as you can see, the, the uh, car is, is related to uh, agreement. Um, and um, it's not, this word, a car, is not paying attention to any of the other words here in the sentence, right? And you can see this, this word uh, is actually evident in these three words, right? Zone, economic, European. Um, it's paying attention to uh, these three words in the reverse order because um, I think this is French. Um, it needs to pay attention in this order. So now this knows that what is the sequence or which are the words uh, it needs to uh, pay attention to. Um, attention is now really big, and there have been newer architectures uh, uh, that claim that attention is all you need and you do not even need LSTMs. Um, that's called a transformer model, um, a transformer architecture. Um, that is a newer version. Um, we do not follow the the sequence to sequence algorithm in Amazon is not the transformer model. Um, it does have attention mechanism, uh, but you also have a LSTM uh, sequence going on. Okay, this is also important to understand. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not doing it enough justice in explaining attention in five minutes, uh, but I'm gonna continue and refer you to this paper which first described attention, and there have been much more advancements in, in attention um, in this space. I would, I would highly encourage you to read through that. All right, so now you will really need to look at scoring, right? This is also very important. Um, um, the common accuracy score that we use usually in machine learning is the um, accuracy score, uh, but in uh, accuracy score has very little meaning in NLP, right? For example, let's say you're given, you are, your network provided this sequence, the cat caught the mouse um, with a dot, end of sentence. And usually in translations, it's not like a, a right or wrong, there could be several ways in which a single sentence could be translated. Like, for example, you can see on the right side. Um, but how are you going to score this, right? This does not match the sequence that it was to translate, does not match exactly with any of the three. But as you can see, if this was what is generated, as you can read through this, this is a good match, right? But how would the, the machine score this? So that's when we, we came up with something called a, a bilingual evaluation understudy. Um, this is a paper that was published in 2002 as to how to make 
a score, a translation. Um, what, on the left is what is called a candidate, um, a string. On the right is what you call reference strings. Um, it usually will have multi more than one. You could have one or you could have more than one. And what it, what it tries to do is um, it, it creates these n grams, three grams, and then tries to match with uh, the uh, reference uh, strings. And uh, when there is a, a complete match, it gives you a score of one. When there is a complete mismatch, uh, it gives a score of zero. Um, there are lots of cases uh, where uh, uh, that, that is taken into account. And it's, this is considered the gold standard for scoring in NMT or even in, in natural language processing whenever you're generating a string. Right. Um, this is uh, very quick and inexpensive to score. I'm not going to be giving more uh, um, um, uh, details about this because that could take like uh, a whole day to, to explain all the different ways. There's one gram, a two gram, three gram, and four gram, um, and there's also cumulative, and then there's a sentence level blue score, and so on. Um, but typically in research papers, they usually use uh, four gram uh, blue scores. Okay. Um, it's quick and inexpensive to score. Um, it's easy to understand. It's language independent because this is applicable to any language. It does not say it's, it's based on languages. As, although this may be a little uh, tricky for for languages which do not define words. Uh, for example, uh, Chinese uh, could be different. Um, uh, it's also very intuitive as just to how we would compare this. Um, it's it, uh, you have to understand that it still does not take the meaning of the of the sentence. Uh, it still only tries to do kind of a, a partial string match. Right. All right. It also has wide adoption. You would see blue scores everywhere, and a blue score right now of the uh, most, uh, the best translator is around, um, uh, I think it's 36 or 37. That's where it's at. Right. All right. So uh, we understood. We, we looked at the uh, architecture of a sequence-to-sequence -sequence algorithm, um, and uh, um, and we looked at a beam search at the end. We also looked at attention mechanisms. Um, if you look, if you try to do this yourself. Um, it, it's going to take you a long time. So we, we published something called MXNet Sockeye. Sockeye is infrastructure um, uh, that provides you all of this. Um, the variations of all the things we talked about are just hyperparameters that you can set. We released this uh, early last year. And you can look at uh, Sockeye. Uh, this is based on MXNet. Um, and uh, uh, there are uh, now newer ways of doing this. It also provides uh, what you, you can see that this is gives you a recurrent, this also self-attentional and convolutional way of doing things. There's been a lot of work done in NMT. Um, um, the reason I mentioned Sockeye is Amazon Sequence to Sequence is based on Sockeye, uh, but they have made uh, some changes to make it uh, align with the other Amazon um, inbuilt SageMaker algorithms. All right. So I would encourage you to look at um, um, the uh, uh, Sockeye, but let's look at a uh, um, a quick demo. Um, I've started a notebook um, on, um, on on SageMaker, um, and there is a sample notebook here. Um, it's from English to German. Um, uh, you guys can uh, try this out yourself. Uh, the first step is you need to provide a bucket, um, as usual, and it downloads the data set. It's a fairly large data set. It takes about um, uh, a few minutes at least to download this. Um, and then it tries to take a small uh, uh, subset uh, uh, of the uh, data set. Um, um, this is to help you run this training faster. Um, I tried this, but the small data set does not give you good results at all. Uh, so this is more to see if the uh, notebook really runs and go through the motions. But um, I did change it to the full, uh, full data set corpus. Um, we also provide you with this example gives you a Python file which, uh, which extracts the vocabulary. Um, and um, and here we are uh, uh, we are topping it at 50,000 types, um, and uh, then you provide these uh, uh, training the uh, the hyperparameters. Um, and uh, the main thing that I would like to uh, show is I'm using P3 16 extra large. That is the largest type and the fastest uh, uh, instance type uh, with uh, uh, with the latest. Uh, a P3 is the latest family of GPU instances, and it has, um, uh, I think, eight GPUs, um, and it can do, uh, um, uh, it's, it's, it's 14 times faster than P2s. Um, and I, I provided that. Um, and you can see the hyperparameters that I've provided. 
right? Um, you need to provide a maximum sequence length. Right now I'm providing 60. The maximum sequence uh, target, that's also 60. The optimized metric is blue. It does also provide accuracy as a metric. Um, I would highly recommend not using that. But that really depends on whether you're using translation, this for translation or not. So this is a general sequence to sequence um, algorithm. Um, uh, it is not limited to translations, right? Um, but this this uh, page, this notebook works on the translation. Um, um, you also have a RNN, uh, number of uh, hidden um, uh, number of layers in the encoder one and two, and then the uh, number of batches is 2100. Um, uh, it does not provide the other uh, 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 hyperparameters. And I ran this. Uh, it took. Um, I, I was quite surprised that it took. I, I ran this yesterday. As you can see, this took. Uh, just over 40 minutes to complete. Um, that was the latest run. Um, that is actually fairly uh, phenomenal. I think it's the power of the P3 16x or large instance type. Uh, so it's, it takes less than one hour. Um, that is, I, I'm, I was I was very happy with that sequence. And um, and and it, it this actually makes it really simple. I I would actually call it um, a deceptively simple. Um, and because all of that architecture, the encoder, decoder architecture, um, uh, attention, and beam search is all um, just defining these hyperparameters. And once you're done with this, you shoot the um, the training job. Uh, it takes 40 minutes, and we're done, right? Um, and I, I also uh, loaded this, uh, uh, deployed this model, um, and I'm going to try out a different uh, sentence here and see what we get. This webinar, uh, webinar may not be a word. Uh, this uh, class talks about uh, machine translation. All right, let's see what is the output we get. Um, UNK means it's unknown word. Uh, I don't think that worked very well. Um, uh, this works great. Till now. Mm, okay. Something went wrong. Um, I think my deployment is not working very well right now. Um, but this should be deployed in about five minutes, um, and uh, you should be good to go. Um, uh, this is the uh, attention. I think we have examples here. Um, you are so good. Um, was translated to Sai signed. Uh, I can't read German, so I apologize for that. Can you drive a car? Is uh, this? Um, and um, I want to watch a movie is translated as this. Um, UNK means it's unknown word. Um, there is a flag that says that you can you can replace this unknown word uh, by the original word, like movie. If movie is a word that it did not know, um, it did not have in the uh, in the uh, in the vocabulary German vocabulary. Um, you can you can make it use the original word in there. So there is a flag for that as well. All right. So um, this is the attention matrix for this. For example, for the sentence, you are so good, was translated as this. Um, I think this is in reverse. Um, you is uh, uh, this, it was paying attention to this. Uh, this word, sin, was paying attention to R, and these three words are paying attention to good. Okay? Um, these two words, sorry. Target is the, um, um, is the X axis. All right? Um, that's pretty much it. The rest is all closing the uh, uh, notebook. Um, I do want to give, bring your attention to the, uh, if I can find this, um, this page. Uh, this is the main documentation page for sequence to sequence. Um, and it talks briefly about how it works. It does not give you real details of how it works, uh, but does provide you links to the various papers it's based upon. Um, I do want to show a little bit about all the hyperparameters. I think we saw a subset of these. Uh, you have, saw the max length, max length target, um, encoder, decoder type, number of layers, um, RNN cell type, uh, and you have CNN cell types. Uh, you have uh, our attention type. There are a couple of different uh, types of attentions. Um, uh, for you to be able to play with, you need to like uh, uh, do a little bit more uh, search. And then you have um, the uh, blue score, uh, blue sample size, uh, and the last is you have quite a bit of this. All this is pretty much um, inherited from the um, um, Sakai framework. 
um, you can you also finally have the beam size. Um, so for it, so I, I think I have given you the most important parts um, of the how the sequence to sequence model works. And uh, 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 little, li dig a little deeper, try this notebook out, and you'd be able to uh, uh, achieve uh, your objective. All right. So I'm going to switch over to questions and to see um, where we are right now. All right. Chris, do we have any questions? My apologies, as I mute. Uh, no questions yet, Pratap. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. Um, uh, so the uh, main reference paper uh, I would point to from the documentation um, is here. That is, um, um, so as you can see, um, Kola's blog that I mentioned is also mentioned here, and uh, attention paper. Um, uh, is here, uh, but the main uh, looking for the I think this model was first introduced by uh, Sats Kiver et al. This is the main paper that talks about the encodings, uh, but the attention mechanism is what really kicked in. Um, uh, this is the uh, the paper that uh, seminal paper uh, that dramatically improved. Uh, the uh, scores, blue scores. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, as I was talking before, um, if I can zoom this thing. Um, at the end of the at the end of the um, uh, uh, the input sequence, you would get uh, uh, embedding or representation of the entire sentence, and that is what is kind of shown here is, is in a two-dimensional way, even though it's multi really high-dimensional. Uh, space, uh, but as you can see, it kinds of tries to collocate uh, sentences that are similar, um, and uh, from which you would go to extract a different sequence of words. All right? Um, I do. <laughs> I do have to mention that this is uh, kind of cutting edge. Uh, the paper, this main product or the algorithm is based of a 2014 paper. Um, and attention is from a 2015. There is also a 2016 paper. Uh, so there would be a little bit of uh, um, um, literature reading uh, that has to be done uh, to effectively harness the power of this. Uh, but the, that is only for fine-tuning your hyperparameters. Uh, but otherwise, uh, uh, the, they have made a huge job, great job, of creating the sockeye and these uh, sequence sequence, which, which brings this uh, enormous framework um, and a flexible framework uh, to be used by everybody. So you can get started in about 10 minutes and you have the uh, uh, latest uh, cutting edge uh, algorithm running in your uh, Amazon account. Hey, right. Pratap, we do have a couple questions uh, rolling in here. Uh, the first one, will this notebook with code example be made available after the webinar? Uh, yes, oh, thanks for the question. This code example is already available. Um, I'm going to Google for it. I'm going to Google for SageMaker um, uh, examples, right? Um, this is the GitHub page, uh, which showcases um, 100 plus notebooks uh, uh, that we have. And uh, I hope this opens now. Um, and, and under this, you would find this in uh, introduction to Amazon's algorithms. And you can search for sequence to sequence here. This is the notebook we just tried. Um, if you are using uh, Amazon SageMaker, um, the entire GitHub repository is already preloaded um, into uh, into the um, uh, notebook instance. For example, if I look at this notebook, this is my notebook. Um, uh, the, you would usually have a, a tab, uh, the, the fourth tab called SageMaker Examples, um, and I um, I drop down here. It's exactly the same as the GitHub repo. Let me close this one. So in under Am introduction to Amazon's algorithms, um, this is the notebook I just tried. You can click on preview, which will just view the uh, notebook, or you can click on use, which would make a copy of your in your workspace, and you can start to run your notebook. Thanks for that question. Okay, uh, so we got another question here. Why should we use our own language translation model 
instead of Amazon Translates. And if you'd like, Pratap, I'll take a, I'll take a swipe at that uh, first. If you Go ahead. Want to so in classic AWS fashion, we provide building blocks. So we have obviously our translate and transcribe services, which give you text to speech and, and language translation services. But seek to seek is a little bit more than language to language translation. You could do long sentence to shorter sentence. It's essence summaries. You could uh, run into an instance where we have a partner who is actually taking the language of the stock room. I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, Wall Street uh, stock exchange floor which is, I guess, from what I understand, a pretty bizarre uh, shorthand of language. And they've actually used translation um, algorithms to translate that into layman's terms. So anytime you need to map one entity to another entity, that could be speech to text. It could be uh, language to language. There's a lot of opportunities there to use seek to seek rather than simple language translations. So like I said, in classic AWS fashion, we provide building blocks. And occasionally, we're going to provide services that do something similar to that building block. But that building block is there for you to customize in whatever fashion that you might need. All right, Patel, if you, do want, to, if you want to add something to that, uh, let me know. Otherwise, we, could, we have a couple uh, of questions. I, I think you, you answered it. Um, I, I could add something to that. Like, uh, for example, um, I think you mentioned summarizers. Um, uh, from long sentences, short sentences. Uh, there are also one more very popular use cases where uh, the Amazon Translate is a general purpose, general, general purpose translator, um, which translates between languages, um, and it may or may not be aware of a domain-specific words. For example, if you are in the healthcare industry, um, there may be uh, names of drugs or uh, medical terms. Um, that it may not be aware, uh, uh, be aware of, or if it's if you're operating the legal industry, it may have a different vocabulary. Um, the way in which the sentences are sentences are formed in the legal uh, uh, legalese is it could be very different from the general conversation. Um, this the the this could be used to uh, fine tune your translation for those those purposes. Um, for um, um, and and but the, the main challenge there is you'll have to come up with your own data set. Uh, which, which provides you that translation or uh, that sequence to the sequence. So that's that's where it comes in. Um, this uh, this is uh, um, this is like I said, uh, we provide building blocks, and um, and this is a great way to experiment with the latest technology. Thanks for top. I think we got time for one one more question here, and. Uh, the question is, do you have to start training a machine translation model from scratch, or are there pre-trained models that you can base your model off of? Oh, excellent question. Um, uh, even this um, uh, notebook, if you look at this notebook, um, we do provide a pre-trained model right here. Um, it's hosted uh, in S3, as you can see here. Um, it shows you how to uh, download that and, and load that model as well. So this is, uh, um, we also have a model zoo um, on uh, MXNet, uh, which also has um, other models that have been pre-built. All right, great. Thanks, Pratap. It uh, looks like we might have time for just one more then. Um, the question is, can we use any other deep learning framework uh, such, as, such as PyTorch? Um, this, okay, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stab at this. Uh, I'm not a PyTorch ex, uh, expert. Um, but what we saw here um, uh, used Python um, in this example only to invoke SageMaker. That is, for example, you're sitting here uh, trading parameters. Uh, this is JSON. And, and then you're making a Bodo call to initiate to start the training session. You're not really, uh, you could use this on Java as well to do the same thing. I use the Java uh, library, um, uh, but I'm not sure if PyTorch provides any value because you're not doing the uh, a deep learning on the notebook instance. You're only invoking um, uh, the SageMaker uh, through the APIs. Do you want to add to this, uh, Chris? Because I'm not familiar with PyTorch. Yeah, sure. I'll add a little bit. We got a few seconds left. So, so we welcome all. Uh, all deep learning frameworks and languages on AWS. Our notebooks use MXNet at their base because MXNet is used internally here at AWS, not because we favor that over any others for partners or customers use. And the seek to seek is based on Sakai, which is also an MXNet project. So if you were to recreate this in PyTorch, nothing is stopping you. SageMaker supports PyTorch and training and deployment endpoints. You would, however, have to create your own, um, basically your own RNN in, in, in PyTorch and then feed that your own data set because the MXNet prepared data set that's in the SageMaker pre 
canned image, if you will, uh, would not be able to support that. So hopefully that makes sense. The uh, the built-in SageMaker algorithms that we call the we call them the built-ins, those all are based on MXNet uh, algorithms. And all right, I think, cool. Thanks, Chris. Sue, no I problems. think you're kind of out of time. Yeah. Back over to, to you, Sue. Thanks, guys. That was great. And thanks, everybody who attended for those great questions. Um, we've got a couple more that we didn't get to, so we'd like to try to summarize those and send them out in an email. You will get an email that's automated coming from GoToWebinar today in about six hours. It'll contain the recording um, of this. Everybody who registered for this webinar will get that recording as well. So if you have colleagues that weren't able to join us today, but they did register, they will get that. Also in that email will be a link to the next webinar, which is two weeks from today. So look forward to seeing many of you uh, in two more weeks. And uh, if you have any other questions, the other thing in that email will be Chris and Pratop's emails if you'd like to send them any messages directly um, and address anything that uh, you had questions about today. So that's it. Thanks so much. I hope you guys all have a fantastic day.